Hi, this is Amber from DSA Threads and my battery's running out, so I might not be able to record this right now, but this is my intro for the overskirt that I just finished called Sotana Senza Imbusto. And we see this phrase and essentially what it means is a skirt without the actual bodice. Um, Ladies definitely used these. Uh, you, you can see them in several portraits where the top doesn't match the bottom or like they're laced to doublets. So let me show you what I did. It was so cool. I, um, I created this really cool trim from a model book and um, it's like this beautiful sparkly gold bobbin lace and took forever to sew on as you saw in my last video. So let's let's dive right in and I'll show you what I did. Okay, so before I begin, it is very common in a lot of portraits to actually have the woman wearing a satana with the bodice and the skirt attached to it underneath a doublet and sometimes it's confusing because you see the doublet and the skirt and you assume they're two separate things. However, in this portrait you can clearly see the points that are attaching the skirt to the doublet, which I can't imagine anything else they'd be attaching the skirt to. So this is not a satana. And then this is the other cool portrait that I found because I don't think she's wearing a satana. The reason, or a bodice, the reason why I see that, say that is because she's opened up so far down that you can see it goes quite under her bust and I, I can't imagine there's a bodice going under there. So those are my two options that I found that are very clearly indicating something else is going on. Um, and then we're gonna move on now to the inventories of Eleonora de Toledo. I just find this stuff so fascinating. So this is basically just a list of the things that she had in her wardrobe and I guess potentially uh, what they were made of, what color they are, um, when they were purchased or when they were recorded. Um, you can see here highlighted, I've highlighted that she, I guess she has had a satana or zamara, um, velvet, flesh colored, um, and it says right there, Senza Imbusto e Manice. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I know I'm totally not doing the Italian right. I'm so sorry. Um, but that means without a bodice or sleeves. And it's actually really cool because you can look underneath and you can see the other components of it even. Copertura doppia. I'm really, really totally murdering Italian. I'm sorry. Um, the doppia is made of silk or satin it looks like also flesh colored that would be the hem that would be the topping on the hem and then you can see it the felt it's backed um the hem is backed with felt to make it stiff and then you can see frangia which is oro e seta i believe that's the trim uh the embroidery and it is in silk and gold so there you have it. There's written evidence right there from an original source that proves that they did have skirts that were separate um, and they were embroidered with very fancy stuff. So now we get to make our own fancy thing. So the first thing that I did was I, as always, drafted my patterns from the Modern Maker book, um, the second book, because that's where all of the women's patterns are. And for this one especially, and I think the last dress I did, I added just a little bit more fabric into it so that I had something more substantial and floofy around the waistline to do the pleating and the gathering. Um, I just like that look a little better than the more conical shapes that the Spanish, which you know those patterns are based on, did. So that's this first picture here. You can see that I just added a little addition to the pattern. And then I began constructing the skirt. Um, usually I fell the seams, which is basically a nice way of just making sure that all rough edges are wrapped and secured down. 
Here you can see I cut out, I took my waistline, I divided it in half. I realize now that I kind of made a mistake in that, like what I really should have done is measured what on my doublet, where, where the side seams should be um, based on the side seams on the doublet, but I didn't do that. I just took my waist measurement, cut it in half, um, and then had two waistbands to gather all of the material into. Yes, here you can see this is all the fabric gathered into the waistband. And then I put it on my farthingale to make sure that everything was all right and good. And then that's the point at which I started to pin up the hem, make sure that everything sits correctly on the form that it actually would be on. This is really important when you're doing hems to make sure that they're sitting properly. And then I began working on the hem or the dapia as we were talking about before. You can see here I'm hand stitching a piece of bias. I believe I did a three inch bias, but it's like, I don't know why, I always feel like it needs to be wider than that. And here you can see the other side. This is me going in and ironing it flat. And then this is where I added my scrap wool in order to pad it out. So this would be the felt that they were talking about in the inventories. And here you can see I'm wrapping it uh, with a whip stitch. And um, what they did back then was I tend to have these little this piping along the edge. Sometimes it was clipped, sometimes it wasn't. In the inventories we were looking at, the satin could have actually been referencing this little um, thing on the bottom here you see, and the backing. But embroidery was also backed with fancy fabrics as well, so it could have been both. And here you have it. This is this is it. The the hem when it's all finished and pretty looking, and it feels so nice when it's finished. It's like the, the weight of it just makes it so lovely to work with. And once I got the hem ready, it was time to move on to the fun part, which is creating the trim. So let's go back and look a little bit at some of the examples of skirts and the trims that they used. And it seems like there's always that very substantial band going down the front and then around the hem. Sometimes it was embroidered, sometimes it was applique, sometimes it was couched, and sometimes, as we see in patterns of fashion, um, sometimes it was bobbin lace that was stitched to the top. And I just fell in love with that idea because the model books have so many different bobbin lace patterns. So I went and I basically just went shopping. I was like, okay, let's go find some something cool that I'd want on my skirt. So here you can see I was looking at Sessa. He wrote a motor book in 1557. And this pattern especially, I was like, okay, I think I can do this. This looks really cool. So I just go, went ahead and saved that picture and put it into my computer and I digitized it. I put it into my USB stick, plugged it into my machine and let her go, which is very exciting. I always love it so much. <laughs> Here you can see this is what it looks like when it comes out of the embroidery machine. It's ready to go and it's still on the water soluble stabilizer and so now it's time to go give it a bath in the sink and basically dissolve all of that away. which is still like magic to me. This is my favorite part. I love pulling the stuff out. I mean, it's just like, <sighs> Next step is to lay it out and you can clap the lace, which means you're gonna take, you know, you're gonna sandwich it between two pieces of fabric and just sort of tap it in order to kind of get all the water and the excess um, water soluble stabilizer out of the way so it doesn't create these little membranes and then you let it dry and this is what it looks like when it's all done these are a little curly i could iron them if i wanted to but um, i'm just gonna you know tack them down all over the place on my skirt anyway so i don't need to and then the process of couching begins so much couching 
And here you can see I also added soutache to the outsides and sort of framed it out. You see that a lot in the motif and it really kind of makes it look very nice. I loved it. So um, I like the fact that the, the trim is like a little subtle. It's not like popping out at you. I did kind of experiment with the idea of putting satin behind it. Um, and it just didn't, you know, it just didn't do it for me. Like, like just having it on its own. So I'm exceptionally happy with how this came out and I finally got to try it on after I did the eyelets. I had to do hand done eyelets and that way it could be actually laced to the bodice. Bye.